So welcome everybody, and uh, thank you for joining our webinar. Uh, this is a bi-monthly series for, from the Center for Science and Technology Innovation. In terms of speakers, we are already joined by Khalid Mata, and uh, we'll be joined shortly by Dr. Nico Kello and John Kalungi, Kabui. So uh, I will start the presentation in the meantime, uh, we're not that many, so rather than only do uh, typing in the chat, what I'll ask everybody to do is to introduce yourself, um, name, organization, and what you hope to learn today. So um, I'll start with, well, Khalid, I'll let you go at the end since you're a panelist. Uh, Mac? If you could introduce yourself. How about Mbari? Just asking, uh, since we're not that many, if you could unmute yourselves. And when I mention your name, if you could introduce your name, your, what organization you're with and what you're hoping to learn today. That way, as we're presenting, we, we focus on addressing some of your key objectives. Okay, thank you. Uh, did you mention my name already? Go ahead, Kelly. <laughs> I'll, I'm actually going to just rejoin in a minute. I have to reconnect one minute. Okay. Nick, welcome. Glad to have you with us. Uh, thank you, Cecilia. Uh, good evening, everyone. Can and you hear me? Going to be one of our, our, our uh, he's going to be the first respondent after the presentation. So we'll get started. Uh, seems like people are shy in talking today. So we'll just get started. So welcome, everybody. And let's start with the next slide. So Introducing the topic of what, why we're doing these uh, webinars. Uh, it's the issue of community learning and looking at uh, introducing the, the global scientific community to differences in philosophy on how knowledge is shared and codified and distributed. Uh, in the philosophy of uh, the Luo community, there's the concept of Otsomo, which is actually a building, uh, a, a building that's owned by somebody for a specific purpose. And it often is referred to as a place where people gather for uh, knowledge. Now, uh, Perhaps in the Western context, that would be a library or a, a, a school or a, a university of some sort. Uh, the subtlety and the difference in translation is that within the traditional uh, uh, indigenous concept of Watsomo, the knowledge resides in the person. And this becomes important when you're doing scientific issues like peer review and validation of learning. If the knowledge resides in a person and I am in Germany and I'm trying to understand what your philosophy is or what your knowledge system is about botany, how do I access your codified knowledge if I don't even know you exist? So these subtleties are important, not because they're in the global term that it's not possible to overcome these situations, it's just 
as we go through our behavioral patterns, we need to understand the history and the culture that we're carrying into the global scientific discourse space. Sorry. So some basic concepts uh, on geosphere, uh, looking at the soil, minerals, fossils, and Nick knows a lot about that given that he's from the mining perspective, so he'll elaborate on that. Digital at SOMO, we're, we're introducing this as the same approach to the Otsomo philosophy, only that we're doing it on an online space. And we're gonna anchor in Proverbs. And today we'll use the Ethiopian proverb, you cannot build a house for last year's summer. And you'll see that repeating on the screen as we go through, it'll be always in the bottom right side. Uh, and before this started, Khalid had explained, and it's something uh, uh, to raise awareness from the, yes, from a geological perspective, Anthropocene, is a term that's widely used. However, for a younger generation to be born into being told that you're in a Anthropocene era of doom and gloom is not very uplifting. Uh, so it, a need to be sensitive to how we define geological terms and whether or not they're empowering or disempowering. And this goes now also to Western scientific peer review, which is who determines these terms that then uh, create this whole global era of definition. Uh, would the term Anthropocene have been chosen if it had been the dominant sphere of scientific discourse had been African instead of Western? And that's a question that we can explore during the conversation. Uh, what is the purpose of scientific knowledge? Is it just to share knowledge for knowledge sake or is it a peer review? Um, how do we determine what we want to recommend? And the fact that we, we know we're living in a digital era where knowledge is progressing faster than we can absorb. So going back again then to if, knowledge is faster than any one person can absorb, how does the community then rectify and rec reconcile knowledge if it resides within the person and not a physical object like a book or a text or online media? Looking at biocapacity metrics, these are terms that you can then look up after the webinar, uh, global biodiversity framework, natural capital protocol, Rio markers, you can start seeing there's a lot of different approaches to looking at these issues and they all sort of differ in their approach. Um, global biodiversity framework is coming at from the perspective of trying to reconcile the different metrics and, and, and philosophies and, and, and what we should be measuring. Natural capital protocol is focused on business uh, looking at a language that can then be translated into accounting balance sheets and looking at nature as an asset, a source of a capital for a business enterprise. Then the Rio markers, uh, that's also an internationally agreed upon convention. Uh, looking not only at the biodiversity metrics, metrics, but also the um, climate adaptation and mitigation metrics and trying to be able to use those for different types of scoring uh, as uh, uh, projects are being evaluated. Then there's the one that is commonly known, which is your carbon or your emissions footprint. Uh, separate carbon because you have carbon dioxide footprint, which is commonly known. There are also methane footprints and greenhouse gas footprints and all the different types of uh, pollutants uh, that you can measure as a footprint. Then there's the ecology. What's the impact of the ecology? How much ecological uh, material is there in good condition and healthy condition in comparison to everything else that's going on? 
beginning to emerge in, in the discussion is toxicology. This comes from not just biology, but chemistry and how do the different types of chemicals that are used, when we say human activity, we're not only talking about whether we build or don't build or how, many, how much raw material we use, we're also talking about different types of chemicals that cause damage, not only to humans, but to uh, a different species on the planet as well. And then overall, it's this surplus versus deficit of accounting and looking at the terms of measurement not being short term, but uh, long term. So 50 years in the future, laying a foundation for survival of future generations. And that is not just human generations, that is also uh, different wildlife and plant species as well. Basic summary on climate change. Uh, a lot of times people say, oh, today the weather was a little strange or uh, I've been noticing that, is this climate change? The fact that you have an anomalous climate reading or an anomalous weather change for a, a day, a month, uh, three months does not necessarily mean that you have climate change. Climate change happens when you have uh, repeated abnormalities and you have a, a duration and you're looking at it over uh, historical trends and future projections. Uh, typically for it to be uh, considered scientifically valid as a change in climate pattern, it, you're looking at a 40 year trend in terms of the historical comparing to actual. Now the challenge with that is um, for example, in uh, a, not, a number of African countries, you don't have historical written meteorological records. So then it's trying to find out at a sublocation level, is this change at the sublocation level really a climate change and asking people and interviewing people and trying to get, get somebody to remember if 40 years ago, this was the type of weather pattern that happened. Whereas in countries that have written history, you can go back often sometimes 200 years in terms of their um, agricultural records and find out what the uh, uh, seasons and patterns were. Uh, as we, you, many of you might've already heard of the IPCC report and getting to 1.5 degrees Celsius, this is where we're getting into this issue of what's called global warming. And it doesn't mean that at one particular location, you'll feel that heat. What it's saying is as the overall sort of average temperature gets to that, you see different uh, climate effects uh, uh, on the environment like you're seeing in the screen, the pictures in the screen. So now that we have reduced and we know now what it is that the climate change patterns look like, there's also the issue of how do you know if you're not um, assured of your memory? The other thing you can do is think about sentinel species, frogs. What we know is that we're seeing a reduction of frogs. For those of you in Nairobi, um, I don't know if you remember probably, if, so if anybody in the group is uh, sort of from the 1970s, come rainy season, all you would hear during the rainy season every evening starting at four o'clock was bullfrogs, bullfrogs, bullfrogs. You don't hear the frogs anymore. So that's a sentinel species. It's not just because of urbanization, but there's uh, uh, emerging evidence that they're looking for cooler places, places where there's um, uh, less uh, invasive, uh, damage to their habitat and they're better able to survive. Now looking at concepts of calendar and time. So the geological calendar is what's used to define the Anthropocene period, which is um, a very long history of human presence on the planet. And so this is looking at the different types of calendars that we have and 
dispelling the notion that Africans did not keep track of time. Uh, there's the stone circles or Adam's calendar in South Africa, the Egyptian calendar, and there's there just been different ways of recognizing the history of the human condition. And uh, you'll get a copy of the, the slides after the, the presentation is over. So basically with these different types of calendars, uh, we're beginning to dispel the notion that there's been no record keeping on the continent. There has been, and it's now being recognized. Now, thinking of the types of houses we built uh, in ancient Egypt, uh, largely stone versus then looking at, at and at the time um, there were not, Egypt was not the only place where stone structures were built. Yes, the pyramids were sort of monumental stone structures, but that history of quarrying and stone building is present now in modern architecture. So it's beginning to look at this question of which last year's summer, and a pun on the African sense of time, is last year um, uh, ancient Egypt time or is last year uh, current uh, last year time? And how do we improve on intergenerational knowledge transmission? So if I were to ask, were the Egyptians comfortable in those stone houses and, and buildings that they built, which metric are we using for comfort? You know, did they, we know they used uh, palm plans and things like that, but what, there was no being able to say um, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and sorry, I'm, I'm more familiar with, with the English term the, and then the metric system, you know, that's the comfortable temperature. What was considered a com comfortable temperature at that point and recognizing that our definitions of comfort change as well over the years. So looking at this issue of why is it that we should be worried about um, industrialization and bioaccumulation? Um, one, uh, we're trying to avoid the, there's no need in repeating the mistakes that have been, we know. So if we know all of the Western industrialization has created all this chaos that we're now even being threatened with carbon taxes for, we can now look at how to industrialize, but avoid those mistakes, kind of like driving safely. If you know that um, there's an icy patch or there's a wet patch on a road or that portion of the road is dangerous, you adjust your, your method of driving. And that's the same kind of idea. Looking at bioaccumulation is this accumulation of toxins and accumulation of problems in the environment. And what we're trying to do is reduce those mistakes, reduce the toxins, increase the surplus of healthy natural resources, and get away from a deficit of healthy natural resources. Now, how do we look at what is safer in this era called the Anthropocene? And, and to Khaled's point, when we started this, Anthropocene creates this eco-anxiety, which is just a fear of being annihilated by your own living environment. And we don't want that. What we, we want is to create an awareness that there is something that we need to pay attention to just like the frogs are paying attention and doing, behaving differently and finding different habitats. We are not as able to just pick up and go. Uh, we do migrate, but it's not exactly free for all in terms of immigration passports and all those kind of things. So how do we create safer places to live so that we can continue to enjoy the benefits that previous generations have enjoyed. And we're looking at construction of the built environment because coupled with industrialization across Africa is this ish notion of uh, improving the built environment and getting closer to higher standards and, and better quality of life for everybody. So climate smart 
construction, looking at biomimicry, which is how do you design buildings to mimic the way in which natural bodies absorb and manage energy efficiently, resource efficiency. Um, we have been looking at a lot of things like rice husk as waste, but they are also good binding material for construction. So what should we be using in terms of different types of cements and clays? Uh, more efficient techniques like digital, digital construction, these are imagined emerging so that you're not only being able to track materials and also being able to identify the materials and the impact in real time, but you can forecast. You can begin to forecast. If I have this much uh, 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 material put in this particular location, what's the chemical effect on that based on different data that's supplied? Uh, energy and air purification, looking at the ways in which our um, material like concrete can be made to react with sunlight or UV radiation and in that sense absorb some of the uh, pollutants that are causing problems. Concrete is, is, is unique in that it causes uh, pollution but it can also absorb pollution at the same time. So it's this notion of understanding that things can be good or bad. So, I mean, some things are just like a nuclear bomb obviously is a, a problem, but looking at raw materials and building materials and trying to figure out where are they fit for a purpose and how can we balance them out? And then looking at how do we determine, what kind of peer review do we use to determine what is good or bad as we're looking at different things. Uh, one of the examples we're gonna use today is straw. So in um, this concept of using straw is called straw bale homes. You can find it in the US and, and uh, Europe and Australia. And they're designed as climate efficient buildings. And a straw bale, they're different sizes, but a, a, a good comparison for today is this one that's sort of a roll, uh, a roll ball of straw bale, and that's uh, 100 kilograms. And the reason of using that is because then we can now start saying, how much does an elephant eat? Because we also know elephants use straw. Uh, as their uh, feeding material. So is straw in an agricultural context, uh, what's left over after you harvest your wheat or your maize or your corn, is that really a waste? If you can then look at it and you're looking at your biocapacity metric, if you're looking at it and you can um, then be able to feed it to animals that are a, a, an essential part of our ecosystem, and not necessarily present, they're present in African and Asian ecosystems, but not in Western ecosystems. So as you look at the, the need to feed elephant straw, then whose measurement of this is an eco-sustainable housing? Who's determining what is eco-sustainable? When you look at comparison of uh, straw bale versus expanded polystyrene, there have been a lot of criticism sometimes that, um, oh, in the African context, you're using expanded polystyrene, that's a plastic, and that's not a, a good choice because plastics are bad for the environment. But then now also looking at how did straw bale homes emerge? And it actually merged in places where there was not enough forest at the time to have your normal building materials. And there was this, what we take for granted now, there was no foam insulation. So you need to survive against the harsh temperatures. Conversely now, when you look at the insulation capabilities of expanded polystyrene in heat climates, tropical latitudes, and looking at the acoustic insulation, EPS, so sound acoustic insulation is your sound noise pollution from the outside. EPS performs better than straw bale. And when it's 
summer temperatures, which we tend to be more year round summer in these tropical latitudes, EPS also performs better. So then when you're now saying which is better, plastic or straw, you now have two dings against straw bale homes. One, we're taking food away from elephants. And two, uh, we have a, uh, the EPS, which is, yes, it's plastic, but it also gives us better temperature control and hopefully a, a reduced need for uh, climate additional energy spent on climate cooling or adjusting during the year. And this is more data on that in terms of looking at how did we come up with this uh, uh, analysis. And we looked at data from Australia, which is sim similar in climate to Kenya. And basically the cost of uh, a straw bale and timber frame house for a 200 square meter house. And looking at the duration, yes, they do last a long time. They last between 50 to 150 years. Uh, elephant's lifespan is about 70 years. So then looking at uh, what the carbon price is, and the, this carbon price is what's gonna be used to analyze the um, carbon tax that we're all going to be paying. And then looking at sort of, if you're saying the green building material like a straw bale home is then a, a mitigation or adaptation, depending on which way you're gonna measure this, uh, impact on the environment. So you want to reduce the impact and you want to reduce your metric tons of CO2 emissions. And you compare that to the value of an elephant, which is not uh, typically included in the building analysis of green buildings in Western countries. You then start seeing that the elephant has a bigger ecosystem's value. Uh, that is about 2,217 US dollars. So when you look at that over 70 year lifespan versus um, 50 years to 70, 150 years for a house, you start thinking a little differently about your choice of materials because now your goal is not just to make the environment good for humans to survive, it's also make the environment good for elephants to survive. So that's a consideration that we need to have on the continent that may not necessarily be applicable in countries where there are no elephants. Oh. All right. And I think... I went through everything. Let me just make sure. Oh, no. Yeah, that was their last one. So now I will hand it over to Dr. Nico Kello, who is from uh, Base Titanium Mining here in Kenya in Kwale County. And uh, he will introduce, Nick, do you need to share slides? Uh, Cecilia, I've, I've sent you um, a slide on, on email if uh, I, can, I can share mine. Let me just try to share. Yeah, hold on, let me Just in it. case my, my net is a bit slow then. Uh... Let me do that. Sorry, I was talking and I did not. There you go. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm sharing my screen and I hope that you can all see it. Yes. Yeah, and uh, just by way of introduction, uh, thank you so much, uh, Cecilia. My name is Dr. Nick uh, Okello. I'm the environmental manager at uh, Base Titanium. Uh, we are based in uh, Kwale County um, in Kenya, mining titanium uh, dioxide. So, um, you know, my my presentation is essentially, you know, stewardship uh, in mining, and it's it's all that Cecilia has talked about. But you know, bringing in the the mining uh, uh, context. 
And uh, I've got about 10 minutes and I'm hoping um, I'll do justice to that 10 minutes. I'll, I'll try to uh, present as, as much as I can within a short period of time, but also try to make it uh, uh, clear. So just to introduce base uh, titanium, sorry. Um, just to introduce base titanium, um, initially base titanium was, tube, was um, uh, owned by, or rather it was Tiomin Resources. And in 2010, Base Titanium acquired uh, Tiomin and we've since been um, uh, producing since 2013, um, continuing with our you know, production and the products are, are as you can see. So we've got uh, Zarkon, we've got Rutile, We've got uh, Ilmenite as our main product. Uh, Zircon obviously used um, within the ceramics industries uh, in refractories and foundry applications. Uh, so you know if you if you the, the tiles that you've got in the house um, and the bathtubs, uh, uh, shower uh, basins. So that's from from Zircon, and then we've got Rutile as well that is used for uh, making of welding um, electrodes uh, and pigment as well. And then we've got ilmenite that is smelted further to titanium dioxide and uh, iron. Uh, titanium dioxide used in the manufacture of paints, uh, in plastics, in textiles, so anything that reflects uh, light essentially has titanium um, dioxide. And you know, just to we, we, we talked speaking about circular economy, and really, I bore it for me. It boiled down to uh, areas where you know we've got recycling or where we are using waste materials within the process to sort of um, develop something else. And I've got our mining process uh, in there. So at the very beginning, uh, I'm not sure if you can see my my cursor or arrow there, but we've got we we mine using water so it's hydraulic um, mining at the very beginning and um, you know that mining whatever is mined then or the mineralized ore then uh, is pumped into the wet concentrator plant where um, the ore is separated into sand and very fine clay materials and then the heavy mineral concentrate that is what we are um, interested in. And that's about 5%, between five and 7% of, of the ore. And that five to 7% of the ore, the heavy mineral concentrate then goes into um, uh, uh, physical separation essentially, which you know, using the physical properties of the uh, heavy mineral concentrate, and the process you know, includes electrostatic uh, separation, there's gravity separation and magnetic separation. So there's no chemical addition to the process. And then um, the products are then tracked or the different, the three products, the ilmenite, the rutile and zircon are then uh, tracked to a warehouse that is about 50 kilometers from the mining facility. And there we've got um, a ship loader um, and, and the product is then transferred or shipped to, to our different uh, customers. Now, within the process, uh, right at the beginning of mining, obviously mining is considered as very destructive. And one of the commitments that we've got as base titanium is to return the land back to better, uh, same or better than, than the way we, we found it. And so our pillar number one, and I've got five pillars, if you can see, the blue um, uh, right things, we've got one is biodiversity conservation, and then two is um, agriculture, agricultural potential trials, obviously after mining, then you know, how best can we utilize the land? And then three is water um, reuse within the mining process. And then uh, four is, I'll talk about wood, wood, wood pallets for furniture. So wood obviously coming from um, the importation of materials. And so it's, it's the, the pallets that are used to either cover the equipment that we import um, or just to, off, to, to uh, as, as a base. And then lastly, I'll talk about uh, the brick making, 
which is from the the slimes or the waste uh, very fine material that comes out from the mineral separation process. Um, so if I move on to the next slide. So in terms of biodiversity conservation, um, at the time when we started mining in 2013, the area around us um, is actually considered a very highly biodiverse area. Um, and so what we did was to start an indigenous tree nursery uh, and collect all the tree species around um, the mine site and the forests around, around us. Um, and the aim for that was to utilize that in the rehabilitation after mining process. So we've got one of the largest um, uh, nurseries in East and Central Africa, I think in terms of species diversity. So we've got about 285 different indigenous tree species that we've grown in our nursery. Um, and you know, we've, we've, we've propagated over 2,500 critically endangered species, some of which are only found within um, the coastal area, uh, for example, we've got, you know, Euphorbia tanaensis that is only found in, in, in Witu uh, forest. Matter of fact, there are only five mature adults um, uh, in, 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 in the forest. And then the other critical thing, um, and you, you'll see it as, as we move along, is the wetlands and, and wetland restoration. Within our mine areas, there, there are voids. Um, there are sail traps, former sail traps that we're now converting into um, wetland areas that are, you know, thriving with, with flora and, and, and fauna. And that is really critical when you talk of um, climate change, uh, sort of carbon sequestration, um, and just biodiversity conservation. Wetlands are really critical. And then, you know, we've got another flagship project, which is Butterfly Project, also showing the communities. Um, using butterfly to to sort of tell how uh, good the environment is but also encouraging that you know uh, the, the 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 rearing of butterflies for international external markets um still on biodiversity conservation in terms of rehabilitation uh and, and i'll move through this very quickly uh, realizing that time is not on our side uh, initially, the, the main thing is uh, stripping the tops. So the tops of the 300 millimeter of topsoil at the very um, of tops. Without that, you're you're doomed in rehabilitating. And so after our mining process, um, what we do is ship the mined area uh, to mimic the surrounding um, drainage system. And then after that, put back the topsoil. You know, test the topsoil to see what enhancements are required. Um, and then an, an interesting bit with our rehabilitation is that we, um, we, we, we get grass seeds from the, from the surrounding community. So we've given them the, the different species of grass seeds that grow around the coastal areas and they rear those and bring that to us and we, we buy those um, from, from the community. So we, we involve them actually in the rehabilitation uh, uh, process. This is a picture of... Um, the mine essentially, and at the at the uh, top ground, at the top uh, of the picture, there you see the mine face. So that's where the active mining is taking place. And then from um, from from the mining, just behind the mining, we do progressive rehabilitation. So these areas have been mined before. This area that you're seeing as green, the areas that have been mined, uh, some of the areas were 20 meters uh, high. Uh, but now are really turning into, you know, very, very, very uh, good green uh, spaces. You can see an example of the wetland um, on, the, on, the, on the left side of, of your screen and uh, also agricultural trial uh, plus that I will speak about uh, in, in, in shortly. So the second pillar, so, so the, the first one was biodiversity conservation within the mine. Um, and then the second pillar is agricultural potentials uh, or trials. Now, uh, I mentioned that mining is considered very destructive, but uh, we are actually showing mining in a different format that you can actually mine land, but still utilize it, um, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a very good commercial way. And so we've partnered with the Pony University. And, you know, as you can see, that particular area, these are different crops. We've tried maize, we've tried tomatoes, we've tried, we've tried cassavas, cotton, simsim, ginger. Uh, garlic, uh, even highland rice, and you know it, it is doing uh, very 
well and therefore in terms of you know mining being seen as a as a negative industry there's actually something positive that can come out uh, of it and we're looking especially at the post mining you know what will the land um, be used for in terms of water reuse and um, recycling so we cannot mine without water and um, my slide there is a little bit busy you know that we've we've got Mukurumudzi as as a, as a water source Mukurumudzi dam you can see that in the middle uh, there I'm, I'm getting notification that my internet is a little bit un, un, unstable so if if you cannot hear me please just uh, shout, uh, let let me know um we've got Mukurumudzi dam we've got uh, the uh, boreholes at the bottom of of of, uh, of of the screen there that we abstract water from but um I've mentioned that after the separation process, we've, we, we have the sand tails and we also have the tailings, uh, the, 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 the fine tails. Now, all these, the, the two main uh, waste products, because it, we, only five to 7% is what we need. So the rest has to be deposited um, to, 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 to various places using water. So especially from the fine tail storage, we, that we, we, we recycle um, the, the most of our water actually comes from that recycling. So you can see for the 3,500 uh, cubic meters of water per day, that is what we recycle from that this particular, you can see the picture at the bottom there, um, uh, facility. And then from the, from the separation plant, also the water that is utilized there is pumped back to the mining uh, area and utilizing the mine. So, it's more or less a closed um, system in terms of um, water, 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 water use, and the main um, sort of loss is, you know, I would, I would, I would say evaporation, and you know, in that sense, also we are, we are working to conserve um, water and pump. Even though we've got, you know, a, a, an agreed pumping capacity from the Mukuromuzi Dam and the boreholes, we actually pump far much less than that because we are able to. To, to recycle. And we also got, you know, gray water that um, is utilized for, for watering grass and in our arboretum as well. Um, number four, just before I, I conclude or finish is uh, wood uh, pallets that we, we use for furniture. So we've got a workshop with insight and uh, all waste wood is uh, properly sorted out um, and we've um, trained cast, uh, uh, carpenters uh, from the surrounding community um, that make you know desks and, and dustbins for schools we, we make uh, beehives for community be um, something that is really good instead of uh, instead of throwing away the wood, is actually making it beneficial to the local community and training the community uh, in, the same, in the same process. And then lastly, I mentioned about the tailings um, or fine tailings material, which we've realized um, recently that we can actually make bricks out of it. Um, and so we, you know, we commissioned a project uh, to start making bricks. We can make bricks that are interlocking bricks uh that you know are very um strong actually much stronger than some of the bricks that uh you know we, we are used to we are accustomed to, to to seeing and so um that is a project that can uh exist for a long period of time even post um mining uh cecilia i think that i have overshot on the time but that is what I had um, for today. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Nick. And, and I, I'm sure everybody is perfectly okay. Uh, the information was very interesting. And uh, Nick has to bow out early uh, for another engagement. So we will take any questions you have for Nick. Uh, we brought Nick in because we thought this would be a good example of managing this issue of the built environment and also what is being discussed in western circles called landscape architecture you saw in the pictures about 
uh, the ridges and hills and all that. And one of the, yes, mining can be destructive, but mining could also be constructive, literally, in that you can shape, reshape your landscape and then grow back. So if there's areas that tend to be flooded, you can build hills and divert things and all that kind of stuff. So any questions for Nick? Reactions to? Hi, Cecilia, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, John. Hey, how are you? Good. Good. I have one question for Nick, and uh, it has to do with the bricks uh, which are being uh, manufactured uh, in that particular location. And my interest or curiosity is around uh, the sustainability of uh, the brick making and whether uh, continuous brick making might create an environmental um, issue. And if it does create an environmental issue, what are the foreseeable uh, remediation measures that you might have in place so that the whole activity around brick making is sustainable, Nick? Yeah, sorry, at the, at the beginning, uh... I couldn't hear you well, but I heard that uh, you're asking what uh, some the measures that we've got in place to to ensure that the brick making um, project is sustainable. Okay, it's a two part. Uh, the yeah. first part was whether the uh, the brick making can be sustainable and for for how long, and what can be the um, environmental degradation issues which might come up. And if at all they have to come up, what are the foreseeable measures that, or mitigation measures that you can put in place to make sure that the environment is not degraded? Thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for that question. Um, now, the in terms of sustainability, and you know, we we feel that this brick project is actually uh, a very good project. Um, the dam or the the tailings dam. That, that we've got has ah, it's millions of tons of, of tails of this soil that we are using for, for making bricks. And therefore in terms of uh, a future, you know, this could take uh, probably, you know, the, the whole of my generation, the next generation, uh, it's, it's, it's massive, it's really a um, big resource. And you know, for us as a company, that a tailings dam is, is a legacy site. And you don't want to leave um, legacy sites as a mine. You want to rehabilitate you know, everything and not have a site that you will keep on um, attending to. And, 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 and so you know, in terms of um, re reusing that particular material, lessens um, that risk of having a legacy site uh, continuing. Now, now, the other thing is, at the, at, as at now, we are doing tests. And we are doing tests with um, the local communities that we hope will one day take over the brick making um, production. So they are learning um, right from the beginning uh, they, are, they are being trained uh, on, on, on uh, the skills, first of all, to produce the, the bricks, but also uh, on marketing skills. We are, we are beginning to use those bricks to sort of build schools around us, you know, uh, build clinics so that uh, the uptake or that they can be seen that, you know, these are really uh, good material and therefore, you know, create um, market uh, in, 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 in that way. And so in terms of utilizing or having a circular sort of concept, the brick making for us is, 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 is um, I think fits into that bill really well. I don't know if I've answered you um, fully. Yes, you have, Nick, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Can I go next? Yes. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, uh, Nick, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I just wanted to comment or uh, 
if it turns out like a question, maybe you could respond. You say that you are doing uh, even better uh, rehabilitation or making it even better than it was. So my, my, my concern is, or my, my question is, is it better to, or is it possible, sorry, to achieve uh, or to totally mimic nature? Like, uh, yeah, that, that, that pictorial that you've shown, uh, the question is, are you, are you able to restore it even better according to what you meant? than the original natural uh, estate. And number two, uh, looking at the crops that you tried, uh, I was just wondering on the status of the indigenous crops, whether uh, the crop, crops that you tried were introduced or they were those that were already accustomed to the environment at that, that place. Yeah, maybe you could maybe uh, comment or respond to those things. Yeah, Th thank, thank you so much. I didn't get your, your name. Sorry, Nick, I'm, I'm, I'm Henry. Henry, Henry, Henry. Yes. thank you so much, Henry, for, for those uh, two very um, good questions. So your question number one is about restoration and can we really restore to better than, than, we, find, than we found it? Now, restoration is a, is, a, is, a, is a factor, is, is dependent on time, actually. And the longer a place, um, the, so, so, so you only see the benefits after a certain period of time. Obviously, nature takes time to, to rebuild. Now, when we, um, we started mining, or just before mining, we had to displace people that were living in those areas. And there are for most of those areas were actually not, they were, in, they were inhabited already, meaning there was already um, uh, uh, interference. You know, there, there was subsistence agriculture and that sort of thing. Now, uh, where we relocated people and we've had the land before mining uh, for you know, a period of four or five years, you can see the trees uh, or the nature that is regenerating there. Now it's the same thing. After we have rehabilitated, uh, we've, we, we, we've plant, we're, we're planting uh, indigenous grass as pioneer species and then trees as well. With the time, if people don't come back to live in those areas, the rehabilitated areas actually have a very good potential to become uh, you know, future uh, forests. Uh, so, so, so the, 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 the way it would get back to better than it was before is when the forest uh, or the grassland really reestablishes and it's not interfered with. Then we can achieve better than it was before because it was inhabited, there was um, uh, agricultural activities, uh, the land was degraded, and we are able to um, bring it back slowly. So that's, so that's one. And then in terms of these trees um, uh, that we are planting, so these trees are from the coastal area, from the surrounding forest. So we've got, for example, Buddha Forest, um, Gogoni Forest, we've got Chimba Hills, uh, we've got Zombo uh, Forest. So the forests surrounding us, what we've done is that we've taken the indigenous tree species the seedlings uh, from, from, from the forest, and we've created the nursery based on the, the tree species that we've, 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 we've collected from, from the surrounding area. So yes, those are indigenous species from the coastal area. Some of them were already in the areas before mining, but most of them we've taken from the surrounding forest. And um, our aim is to, you, to use them to bring back that land that you're seeing, that grass, that eventually, you know, we'll have shrubs, we'll have uh, trees, and 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 that area will will you you know if if you if you uh, had an opportunity to see it before and after, then you you you'll see a big difference. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Nick, uh, and, and very interesting uh, uh, perspectives there. Uh, lastly. Uh, since 2013 to date, uh, from your experience and you've worked there for some time, can you say there has been improvement in uh, 
uh, the state of, of the standard of living uh, of communities because uh, this, this tradition of uh, most companies uh, doing extraction of, of natural resources at the expense of social uh, sort of lives. So uh, could you just make a comment how that has impacted the community? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Th th thanks for that. So base titanium employs about um, 700 uh, employees. So if you if you think maybe, you know, there's three uh, dependents per, per employee, then you're talking about, you know, 2,100 2, um, uh, people directly uh, deriving, you know, in, in an income source from, 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 from base. And then we've got the contractors also that you know, supply materials uh, and services from, from, from around the area. The majority of the people that are employed are from the surrounding communities where if, if, if the skill is available in, in that particular surrounding area. So we've got a fencing, a, a sort of fencing employment system where fence one is just the people that um, uh, from either the ones that were displaced or immediate surrounding of the mine. And then we've got fence two, so it's a wider quali. Fence three is a wider coastal area. Fence four, then you move outwards uh, to the rest of Kenya. And then we've also got expatriates, that's, that's uh, fence uh, seven. And those are very few with very um, de dedicated or with, with, with experience that we cannot easily you know, find within the country. So, so employment is, is there. And then, you know, the, the other benefit that has come from the mine is, you know, there's, there's schools around. Uh, the infrastructure within the schools. So, so, so building you know, a, a, um, a class focusing mostly on this, on the ch children from the surrounding community areas that we capacitate, we employ them within base training and they get uh, um, experience and then move, move outward, move, uh, can, can be an agreement with the community. So we call it, well, we call it community development agreement where 1% of our, our, our profit. Okay. Sorry. Back. Yeah, I don't know if there's any other question. Yeah. Yes, Cecilia just finished with the, the question uh, that Henry uh, had asked. Great. Any other questions for Nick? Khaled, did you have any questions on the biodiversity? Um, yeah. Because what I've, we've experienced here in South Africa is that, you know, the, the construct of biodiversity apart from people becomes very rampant when exploitation is afoot. And sadly, the people in South Africa and I guess across the African continent as a whole are in different phases of industrialization. So. The, one of the earlier phases, which is uh, reliance on natural resources, is still seen to as the major absorption, labor absorption mechanisms for taking people uh, straight from, uh, you know, childhood, adolescence into the working environment without any, uh, you know, fundamental education or upskilling being done. And so labor is a resource. How biodiversity fits into that is that this labor as a resource doesn't uh, value biodiversity anymore because now their modus of uh, economics and their modus of lifestyle is changed into service. So no longer are they living off the land in a form of, um, and, I, and I don't want to try and push the noble savage mentality, people need dignity, but no longer are people living in tune with the land, mines and exploitative um, industries create this disconnect and the African labor force well, because we're in Africa, I'm just using that moniker, that, that labor force becomes a component of the separation 
between people and biodiversity. And the communities that spring up around these uh, mines and labor exploitative areas, they found that the mining dividends never really trickled down into them. So 0.9%, uh, I think is a stat I read somewhere, of all communities, uh, no, no, sorry, 0.9% of the benefits of the revenues of mines uh, go back into communities. So you're left with a degraded environment if rehabilitation doesn't take place and a, a wandering labor force looking for their next uh, you know, low industry, low tech uh, job. And they can spend years unemployed and this adds to social ills and then biodiversity takes a knock and such and such. So it's not much, it's not more of a question, uh, more of a comment and an observation uh, from the South African environment because I've also worked a bit with mines and understand the kind of socioeconomic issues that spring up because of these communities and the environmental aspect usually takes a backseat when uh, rape and gender-based violence and such become so prolific in the spaces. And Kylie, does South Africa have a post-mining uh, rehabilitation requirement? Yes, in fact, it, it's supposed to have a very strong post-mining rehabilitation requirements. But what we've seen is that when the larger mining houses are done with the exploitation of the resource, they sell this uh, mine closing process to another company. So all the destruction that goes along with this uh, now exhausted mine is sold to other organizations. And the, these mines can remain like this in a state for many, many years. And what's been happening more recently is something called uh, Zama Zamas, which are non-South African nationals uh, come to eke away at the scraps of whatever minerals or resources are still present in the mine. And that can lead to the trapping under the mine. It can lead to earth shifts. It leads to a lot of terrible problems and uh, especially violence when there's not contestation between the wanton labor force who are abandoned by the larger mining houses and the Zama Zamas who are vying for the same leftover resources. So it's a social problem and an environmental problem. And environmentally, we have things like acid mine drainage, your leachate, your, you know, your fumes, your gases that spew forth from the mines, um, and lots of particulate pollution as well. So I'm not going to say that there's really success stories off the top of my head of rehabilitated South African mines. It's a nice uh, concept, but there's more uh, damaged environments really in terms of biodiversity and worrying about nature than there are rehabilitated, rehabilitated mines. And, and, and you, you raise a good point, Khalid, because uh, base titanium is, a uh, Nick likes to re remind me they're small. Do you see the same problems uh, with the small mining companies that you're mentioning with the large mining companies? Well, many of the smaller mining companies, uh, you know, this is a tricky question because I, they, there's like political connections, they are ego, egoists and megalomaniacs who have some amount of wealth who go out there and uh, create mining ventures at the expense of the natural environment. So you get a lot of activism, uh, which is now joining in terms of the social justice. I, 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 maybe you've heard of the, the colors of the environmental movement. So there's the green environmental justice movement, which is pushing for all the, the, you know, the hippie stuff, the club environmental and climate justice and you get your browns which are dealing with the actual pollution that comes into the environment and then there's the red environmental movements which are dealing with uh, components of access as accessibility and the natural resources what we've noticed over the past few years is this blending of the colors of the environmental movements to actually put uh, put their foot down collectively against uh, exploitation which is guided by politics and guided by wealth inequality so, yeah. Thank you, that's really interesting. And, and also uh, uh, we, we do have mining in Kenya uh, or in different types of mining. So uh, lessons to be learned from South Africa, which as you point out, sort of has a, a, a larger mining industry than Kenya does. Any other questions? 
Cecilia, if I can just you know add a little bit to 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 what uh, Halid has, has has talked about, and sure. you know I worked. I worked in uh, in South Africa for about ten years, uh, Halid, in in Richards Bay area, which is very much industrialized um, area. And so, you know, to, I think it was yesterday that we had the the World uh, you know Air Quality um, Day, and um, I studied air quality as as um, on 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 my doctorate, and it was air quality in the Richards Bay uh, area, the impact of that on human health and the policy response effectiveness. And um, it, the problem is real in terms of air quality pollution. Uh, and South Africa, you know, obviously in terms of mining, it's way, way, way up there compared to, to, to Kenya. Um, but one other thing that I can also add in terms of environmental care, uh, you know, worked with, with Rio Tinto, Riches Bay Minerals, um, and their rehabilitation is uh, considered as a good uh, example, you know, within, within the mining area in South Africa. So they've got indigenous rehabilitation, but also commercial uh, forest rehabilitation, but the indigenous bit is um is 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 thriving it's good to see uh it's been studied um and i think the literature is out there in terms of you know how how how, how good it is uh, thanks for that and we've learned obviously a lot from from south africa our experts uh the few that we've got most of them are from south africa um so you know that's 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 good learning from from that side but we are putting it we are kenyanizing it and it's 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 you know much much better. Thank you. And Nick, for those who are not familiar with the mining industry, uh, Rio Tinto tends to have a different echo in people's minds due due to the uh, tailings facility collapse. I think was it in Brazil, Latin America? Can you sensitize the, the everyone towards why is it that a company can succeed in one location and have Tremendous challenges in another. Yeah, so 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 I think it was it was Valley, not your Tinto, that had the the collapse uh, of the of the tailings dam in uh, in Brazil, um, and we've also got a, a tailings dam. That's where we are getting this clay that we are using to 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 make you know brick. Um, but you know, Khaled mentioned that most of the companies leave their post-mining issues to another company to deal with, which I think, you know, for me is, uh, it's, almost, it's, it's running away from, from the main thing, actually, because once you're done with getting the resources, um, for, for a company, especially the multi multilateral, um, the smaller companies might actually do that. But for big companies that are listed, you know, in, in stock exchanges all, all around the world, their reputation really matters. And therefore, uh, closure and post mining land use takes a central stage because um, if you're seen as irresponsible from where you finished mining, then getting financing for the next project becomes a really big issue and also your shares. Uh, tumble down. So, so, so for the for the multi for the multilaterals, the bigger companies, um, I think I've seen that there is more commitment uh, towards bettering the post mining um, facet of of of, of the whole uh, mining process. And for base titanium, um, I think that's a in in addition to the to the to the uh, investment that we are doing on rehabilitation, the post mining aspect is equally keen, and we we are doing pre feasibility studies. I've, I've I've shown the picture of um, of the agricultural trials that we are doing. There's conservation, lots you know, massive conservation possibilities, and so we are looking at you know what will make people remember that you know base titanium was here, and they didn't leave a big hole on the ground or in the ground. They've left something, you know, good. So, you know, for 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 us, I can I can I can I can say that you know uh, that post mining land use and the current rehabilitation is a critical aspect, and we are we are we are investing um, the required 
energy into it. Thank you so much. And uh, this has been a rich discussion already. Uh, John, uh, we'll switch to you so that we, we have equal time for you and Khaled to present and then have questions and answers. Uh, and then Nick, don't worry if you have to uh, uh, drop off. Uh, this has been wonderful and we're, we're so glad you joined and uh, we, we got this recorded, thank you. John, do you want to present slides? Uh, uh, hi, Cecilia. Uh, I think, I, in fact, I'll not be able to present because I had a bit of a challenge with my computer where my presentation was. And so, I, unfortunately, I cannot be able to retrieve it. At the moment, I've actually logged in using my cell phone and uh, probably maybe we can uh, move on to the next uh, presenter. Apologies for that. No problem. Uh, that would be fine. Khaled? Yeah, yeah, I'd like to present. I have this presentation, which I... Well, I want to just present several slides from it and speak to that if that's possible. Okay, yes. So, so yeah, I, I need the yeah. capacity. Yeah, just to thank you. Share the screen. All right. Thank you so much. So, um, as I mentioned, this presentation was called uh, Our Equitable Oceans. And it was all about um, speaking about the, the splendor of the oceans and how they you know, constitute so much to the living world and they are under threat and about biodiversity, how it's, uh, as you mentioned, a multilateral resource that spans, so the ocean itself is like the perfect metaphor for multilateral because on land we have physical borders which humans can't cross, but the ocean is uh, more contiguous and it's uh, like, you know, undifferentiable, but there are issues happening to it which uh, diminish biodiversity like climate change, disturbance, invasive species, uh, pollution, ecological degradation, and especially overfishing and, and destructing, uh, destructive techniques. And in the presentation, well, I'm not going to talk too much to these uh, aspects, like uh, I mentioned how there are issues which are also, like the ocean itself, multilateral, multi-boundary, transboundary, like climate change. What was uh, instigated by the global north through the industrialization after World War II in the petroleum uh, depression, the petroleum crisis that led to, you know, the, this mass industrialization on the world and uh, greenhouse gases becoming uh, pro pro prolific and carbon dioxide being trapped. But um, more to the basis of what I want to talk about uh, is this, the core of the climate and the biodiversity crisis, and that is neoliberal capitalism. So I'm not too sure uh, if you are familiar with this, this mechanism of economics, but essentially, it was globalized, uh, a form of economics was globalized after World War II by Edward Barnes and uh, Sigmund Freud, I think they were relatives, uh, which sold consumerism as the ultimate method of uh, getting wealth concentrated in the hands of the elite. And this was foisted onto the American people and ultimately onto the world at large. And it follows a cycle of privatization, global inequity global inequality, exploitation, outsourcing, low wage work, cutbacks in social services, and then the austerity enhanced, uh, enforced by the state. And then again and again, it is the cycle flows into each other. And what biodiversity and the climate crisis, because they are interlinked, the biodiversity on earth represents living carbon and the climate represents the stable environment that the biodiversity requires to flourish. So I always speak of them together. Uh, this kind of economic system was adapted, globalized, and accepted by many, many countries around the world, and we're perpetually stuck uh, in, a, in, a, you know, in a cycle of exploitation within our own countries, where our natural resources from the global south are feeding an unsustainable lifestyles in the global north. So this slide also speaks to some of that, where uh, 
uh, oil drilling and overfishing, um, you know, essentially resource exploitation uh, uh, was globalized and resource exploitation um, also kind of was adapted and polished in such a fashion that we see it as the modes of our own economy. So into this mix, I spoke about uh, humanity, ego versus eco, how in the, gen in the global south and specifically in Africa, we didn't really partisan ourselves away from the natural world. We saw our ego as part of the ecology. We, we saw, you know, something like Pan-Africanism and Ubuntu, I am because you are, we are because I am, things like that. Those naturally spoke to the anti-frontiersman attitude of the global uh, North. Their mentality, if I can be so, uh, you know, candid and so blunt, is to try and build a base and then build a base by yourself, for yourself, and then help others afterwards. It's a very uh, noble and also simple mechanism uh, of thinking, but there is no yourself if you look at it through the African uh, the lens, because yourself obviously comes from a society which raised you and parents which raised you and people who helped in unfathomable, undistinguishable ways. There is no a basis for yourself. There is no frontiersman because you never become uh, you never come to this earth alone. So what happens over time is a separation and this domination of ideals, uh, and it's justified as societal natural selection. Into this mix, we have uh, protection, because obviously we all live on the same planet, and we need to protect uh, resources for future generations. So concepts like the Millennium Development Goals, like the Sustainable Development Goals, like the IHE targets, um, like uh, there's another one which I'm forgetting right now, but uh, they, they spoke, they speak to protecting the plan. Oh yeah, sustainable development. I think, yeah, millennium, millennium development, sustainable. The concept of sustainable development was to preserve some of the, the world's resources for future generations to use, for the youth. But what's been happening, especially if you look at the climate and biodiversity crisis, is that those resources, a stable climate and ample biodiversity with all the genetic information that that contains is being you know, eroded, it's being devoured by the unsustainable lives of the present. So that's not going to be left for us in the future. Uh, then there's protectionism as mechanisms. Uh, so there's strongly enhanced protection, which utilize this need, this demand for uh, sustainable development to create separation between those who have resources and those without. Those without um, education, without access to formal avenues for grievance, et cetera, are pushed off their natural resources in the, in the hopes of protecting land and protecting parts of the earth for future generations or alternatively for the elite. So we have something called toxic conservation. Conservation, which is toxic to the people who live around the uh, conservation areas, around the uh, protected areas. So some this also goes by the name of fortress conservation. I made up the name toxic conservation because, you know, the youth, I felt like, you know, everyone's saying you toxic, this is toxic. So I said that the talk, conservation is toxic. And <laughs> um, this actually was, inspi this inspired me uh, to take, really, take a really deep look at some, at one of the overarching narratives in the conservation space. And I know uh, my, my time is not too long, but I want to play this two minute video by Nemo Basi. Uh, and it's in, it's part of my presentation. And at the end of the video, I have a snapshot of my paper that I helped produce the shared earth concept. So if you can indulge me for a second, um, for a few minutes actually, this is the big blue green lie, which speaks to the latest conservation uh, imperative around the world. And it's a very amazing video by Nemo Basi. You do care about nature, don't you just? You recycle lots. Ride trains instead of planes. Never wear four. Organic food a must. You lose sleep over climate fears. The rising oceans, the falling forests, and the polar bears. Oh, the polar bears. You know how it feels. Hearts just shrink. So many worries. A forest fire, a poachy massacre, and other species gone extinct. You cry for answers, but they are not there. Conferences, words, politicians don't care. Everyone knows it's so unfair. But now we are saved. All 
all will be well. Protect 30% of Earth, climate, biodiversity, all sorted. It's on Facebook, must be right. This new magic spell saved the world from us. Conservationists agree. But who dreamt of 30%? The boys polluting land and sea. The guys who consume the most. Business snatching your box with glee. Nature thrives people out. No time left for doubt. But hang on, where is your address? Look deeper to fathom the mess. Where is your address? Whose homes are these? Who lives there? Remember the empty colonies, home to folk, black and brown, such wealth for you to seize. All the brutality, protected areas are nothing new. Kick us off ancestral land. Raped, beaten, shot. That story, not taught, is known by just too few. Not again. Another monstrous mess. Indigenous peoples live with nature. We make landscapes you think wild. We nurture them by far the best. That is our address. You are protected areas, our homes, our living by sustaining hand. You binging consumerism, neither rooted nor sustainable. You, 30% tourists who grab more our land. They bleed. It's for the good of all. We cry. It's the big green lie. Let's all howl. Halt. If you care about nature, you must respect indigenous people's lands. Protected areas are destroying the people and diminishing the earth. We belong to each other. Okay, um, so thank you for that. Thank you for indulging me in that video. So 30 percent, um, 30 by 30 was this conservation concept I came face to face with earlier this year when I was still working, you know, because I'm past that. And now I'm working for an environmental organization, which is actually dealing with occupational hygiene. But when I was with this NGO, I was very heavily involved in uh, conservation narratives and the policies around conservation, especially in Africa. Uh, and I was fed uh, several papers in February about the Das Gupta report and 30 by 30. And as I read these, and I had this background of social justice and understanding uh, capitalism and neoliberalism, I re recognized that this was a wishy-washy kind of mechanism for an enhancing conservation uh, capitalism through conservation grabbing of land so i kind of pushed back against the 30 by 30 narrative and ultimately i parted ways with that uh, ngo it's a it's a proposal pushed by the global north to protect uh, 30 percent of the planet in strongly protected areas uh, for the um, continued ecosystem services that these areas can provide and it was it is cooked up after the ideal of half earth by E.O. Wilson and several other scientists have latched onto it. But especially if you look at the economics of biodiversity, that's the name of the Das Gupta review, which talk about uh, nothing really salient in my opinion, but it talks about how uh, biodiversity is under threat and we need to pay more to, to save it. And 30%, 30 by 30 is one of those mechanisms for doing that. If you look deeper into that, um, you'll see that 30 by 30 is kind of a, a washing machine. So I had, <laughs> this is this was part of an animation where I would, yeah, you see the major conservation um, functions, major conservation uh, organizations in the world, uh, which push 30 by 30, like the High Ambition Coalition, the Leaders Pledge for Nature, the Nature Conservancy, Campaign for Nature, the Global Environmental Fund, those which push toxic conservation are actually backed up by the economic uh, pillars of this world. And those kind of uphold toxic exploitation. If you look at the Global South, which is exploited to uphold the unsustainable lives of the Global North, these are the industries which maintain all of those negative uh, economic mechanisms I spoke about earlier. 
um, the privatization, the austerity, the, the markets and finances. So they push for the 30 by 30 narrative. And that triggered in my mind uh, this, you know, like how can we allow it to happen? I wonder if I can just go back and, you know, uh, no, I don't want to see the video again, but okay. I thought after the video comes, I would um, have my paper there, but I will make that uh, the link to the shared earth paper also available. And that fundamentally closes off my presentation and my discourse today. How do we reconcile now what is happening to biodiversity and the global exploitation we're living in? We, we cannot address the problem whilst the house is on fire. If we don't address the inequality that's fundamentally at the cause of exploitation of the global uh, south, we're never going to deal with the biodiversity and climate crisis. Everything is going to be like chalk. It's going to be insincere. There has to be reparations, there has to be sincerity, there has to be sustainability, but not coming from the people who need to industrialize and get dignity for their own lives. It has to come from the global north, which has been absorbing and siphoning off the wealth, literal natural wealth of the planet for so long. Um, and this book in the middle, The Conservation Revolution, that um, also was a guiding template for my thinking over the last few months. And yeah, that's where I hope to end it. I've got references also in the presentation, which I said I'll make available to you. Thank you so much, Cecilia, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Kelly. That was wonderful. And, and uh, uh, for those who, uh, I don't know, I think I, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we started this with the concept of the Anthropocene and Khaled mentioned that for younger generations like his, it's a pretty disempowering term. So uh, I have a lot of uh, questions, but I'll hold them and ask who wants to ask uh, Khaled some questions. Hello. Hello, yes, Cecilia. How Hi. are you? Good, Mr. Dow, how are you? you? Fine, fine. Yeah, thank you. Sorry for coming late. But I've had a good bright ideas from your presenters. I hope you have seen my comment. I've just said that I uh, would appreciate if all those presentations are forwarded to participants, particularly me, I would like. And uh, I hope for people whom you have not met, uh, my name is Odao Diambo. I'm teaching at Stockholm University, Nairobi, Kenya, and Tech University in Kenya also, in Nairobi. And uh, here in this forum, I represent Kenya Renewable Energy Technologies Association. It's a professional body specializing in all types of renewable energy. It's based at Stato University Energy Research Center, the East and Central Africa Energy Research Center. And I'm also representing East and Central Africa Renewable Energy Federation. We are just a, a, a consortium of 15 countries in East and Central Africa for renewable energy. And when I say renewable energy, we are including all of them. Of course, solar photovoltaic is uppermost in, our, in African region and particularly East and Central Africa. It's most implemented part of uh, renewable energy. It is hitting now in many countries, it's varying. In Kenya, it is hitting almost 40%. So it's more used than any other renewable energy. Of course, in renewable energy also, we have biogas. We have got wind as a source of alternative sources of energy or renewable energy. We have got biomass. We have got mini hydros. Those small village rivers can be turned, can generate electricity for the community. And we are talking about biodiversity. Diversity. Mini hydros can play a very important role for biodiversity. I've already seen from the presentation some attached here and there. The local rivers. We are not talking about the major rivers like River Nile, but mini hydros in the small village local rivers. Of course, some of them are seasonal, so they cannot, I mean, which are closed for. Twenty-four months in a year, and they are made. They generate electricity. We call them in hydros. 
I'm just giving a brief of what is renewable energy, which we specialize in. I hope Cecilia, you can understand me. Our background is heavily renewable energy, and we consider ourselves to be game changers. We are game changing the whole process, shifting from major hydros, River Nile, and Panama Canal, all those are big rivers which generate high electricity, but they, at a very high cost, and the costs are shooting through the roof. Many, many African people, 900 million people in Africa do not have electricity, just we rely, because we rely on major hydros. And that's a big disadvantage. So as we discuss biodiversity, let's look at how the population To generate, to generate hydro, we rely on ginger. We import electricity from ginger, please, for your information, because ginger is river Nile. It's bigger than all our rivers in Kenya. Then we have Kiambere, but it is the weather change such that the level of water is always sometimes far below to generate. So we have to import electricity. And that's why it makes it very easy for the use of solar. Of course, the cost, you are very right, is high, it's expensive initially, but for long term, it is cheaper. But that initial capital usually is what is keeping off many, a larger percentage of Kenya, 47 million people. So very few people, it is isolated, and I agree with you, but it is a better alternative than the major hydro, which, which from Kiambere, it is too, is generated in Canberra, it has to be transported to all villages. The cost, of course, is the innocent domestic homes who must pay, and therefore the, the prices shoots up. So to us, in renewable energy or in energy industry, we are just replacing one capitalism, capitalism approach with another. But the other one of hydro, major hydro is too expensive. Well, that's why more people, more population have less electricity. So I don't know, for us, if it is still like happen to be cheaper than the major hydro, then it is better as much as it is capitalistic, the way you put it. So we are trying to look at other alternatives like bio, biogas, biomass for cooking and many others and wind. But all those still capitalism comes in. So at the end of the day, which one is cheaper? or other than doing without, which one is better? So probably I will need your advice, all of you, on that. Thank you. So, so uh, thanks a lot, uh, Diambo. As you as you uh, uh, drop that particular thought, I'm, I'm just wondering if you could maybe focus on the political bit of of solar uh, panels in Africa. Yep. Uh, whether you, I mean, I would like to know your positionality regarding uh, this issue of uh, of solar. In, in Africa and the, the concern of it coming from the global north and linking that to what Halid presented, the, 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 the proponents of the 30, 30%. So is it you as Odiambo or it is the, the, the green capitalists? Thanks. Yeah. I actually wanted uh, to, uh, to weigh in on uh, with a response to that. And uh, I just wanted uh, to share that this is John Kabuir, and I wanted to share the fact that um, the world is agreeing that we need to move away from uh, fossil fuel based energy. And the next question is, why don't we go out for renewable energy? So when the whole idea is about going out there for renewable energy, the question is there are numerous forms of uh, renewable energy. And if there are numerous forms of renewable energy, uh, the next best thing to do is to identify which one is actually available in abundance in whichever area you are. And of course, how you can be able to access those um, technologies which are available to be able to harness that um, 
renewable energy. So uh, I won't say that uh, there is a heavy drive for everybody to adopt uh, solar PVs. And if at all it was, all that nations need to do is to understand how to generate that renewable energy, where they can be able to manufacture their own uh, solar panels and be able to install their own solar panels. That way also, in a way, can be able to reduce the cost. But besides that, there are other forms of uh, renewable energy which can be employed. And I think uh, it's all about how much innovation we can be able to uh, bring in ourselves and see that we work on something that can be able to reduce uh, the cost of energy instead of probably maybe being there and uh, heavily dependent on maybe importing technology. Yes, we also importing technology, but then the next question is, of all the technologies that we've been importing, have we done something to see that we are able to uh, replicate that technology just like the way the Chinese are doing it? So when you talk about cost, you realize that that conversation, for instance, won't mix, um, uh, I think uh, would hold water, for example, like in China, where they can say that we are able to manufacture our own uh, solar panels. And that way, uh, we don't see that as a, as a barrier or a, a, a green economy, a, no, a green uh, politics or something like that. So that's just what I wanted uh, to weigh in, sort of like to give it a lot of thought and see that um, no one form of renewable energy can be imposed, but which one works actually best for you. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to weigh in on that, uh, Odiambo and um, John. I, I watched recently last year a documentary called Planet of the Humans, which actually explained how, you know, the energy problem is fundamental. It, it's, it's wherever you're getting your natural resources from, whether it's the cobalt and the silicon and the lithium that's going into renewables and coming from exploited parts of Africa, or whether you're getting your coal and um, your natural gas, which are coming also from exploited parts of Africa. Uh, but in a more localized fashion, the, the, the externalities imposed by reliance on these natural resources is worse for the fossil fuels, because if we go back to the discussion on the mine rehabilitation and the emissions and the coal and all of the negative impacts that uh, surround uh, burning of fossil fuels, you will see that those far outweigh um, any positive uh, impacts that you would uh, get from utilizing uh, fossil fuels and therefore switching to renewables, despite their additional, you know, green political, green capitalist, uh, push is more viable in the long run and with renewables we can it's renewable in the world we don't have to maintain this false dichotomy this kind of facade of uh, capitalist and exploiting the natural world to generate this energy um, but to get back to your first question uh, I think it was Henry you asked me if this is the climate crisis and the biodiversity is a deliberate crisis, and I and I will agree and say yes, it's a deliberate crisis. It's it's an, it's caused by unsustainability and excessive uh, comfort in the global north. They drive trucks. Almost everyone lives a life which of meat, of water, overusing water, overusing natural resources. They they need to adopt a mentality of degrowth literally to actually fix the world that we're living in. They, they have, it's excess. They, they have too much, many of them. The, the global North live a lifestyle that's never going to be achieved by the global South. And if we try and achieve that, we are rebounded or rebuffed by this a threat of the climate and the biodiversity crisis. We're told to adopt sustainable ways of living. And, you know, there's no food garden pathway out of this mess there's no food garden pathway to socialism there's no food garden pathway out of the climate crisis to like we'll be told to grow our food garden and eat off the land but in the same breath we're sold agrochemicals and fertilizers and our indigenous crops are exploited by uh, multinational corporations to make you know you know just to just to do more and more capitalism and <laughs> i hate to say saying it like this because it sounds ridiculous but it's literally what's happening it's literally our resources are being absorbed 
eaten, abused, and we're chopping down our forest to grow food crops that's going to make the next McDonald burger to be fed to some fat kid in America. So it's a deliberate crisis. It's very bad. It's like almost impossible to address collectively as the African continent unless we join hands and say, we have this biodiversity, we have this untouched land, we have the megafauna, and you're not coming to Africa until you start paying the price, the real price, the real cost. And stop destroying our land, stop exploiting our people, stop ex you know, exploiting our resources and getting away with it to you know, put another crown on the queen's head. So yeah, that's where I'd like to end off. Thanks everyone for keeping the discussion going. Uh, I had a power failure uh, in the neighborhood as <laughs> Mr. Adiam was talking about uh, uh, renewable energy. Uh, I think there's some good points coming out. One is this issue of uh, maintaining biodiversity is not about keeping so-called pristine lands pristine and uh, that being uh, you can't force emerging economies not uh, say you know you're this pristine land which is actually not true because pollution is spread everywhere uh, you're this pristine area and you have to maintain yourself in this pure uh, large uh, conservation ecosystem while the rest of us keep on doing business as usual. And one of the things that's forgotten in the discussion on indigenous people is that certainly in North America, Canada, US, there's large tracts of indigenous people, even in Europe, uh, like in even in Scandinavia, the Sami people. So you have people who are forced to live on reservations. Uh, and in Native American cultures, uh, it's sort of, again, this myth that, you know, if you're not running a casino or, or, or doing some kind of uh, tribal activity, you are violating uh, the, what you've been allowed to do on your tribal land. Uh, and if you try to have even though technically you're legally independent if you try and develop a lot of that and uh, develop your own form of sort of like uh, industrial hemp growing even though industrial hemp is uh, not uh, hallucinogenic and is good for building materials uh, there's a lot of raids on tribal land for growing industrial hemp but then uh, once people realize what it was, then it's okay to grow it if you're not on a tribal land and where the benefit sharing happening with that. Uh, the Sami people in, in Scandinavia and sort of being relegated to re reindeer keepers uh, and, and not being thought of as human beings that can develop arts uh, or can develop digital technology and why can't that so it, it shouldn't be a dichotomy in which the preservation of biodiversity means limiting people from uh, industrial achievements. Simultaneously I'm hearing that this notion of benefits sharing and benefits accountability so uh, you can't be extractive without being uh, uh, replenishing what you've taken out. And that is not only in uh, industrialist countries replenishing what they've destroyed within their own boundaries, but taking responsibility and accountability for if you already know that this is a problem why come to other countries and do the same thing that you already know, mess things up and then say, this is a problem. So being accountable from the get-go and saying, this is a problem, we just won't do it this way. And then third is this issue of um, 
which economic model will work. And it's interesting to hear um, uh, the, 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 the reaction to uh, neoliberal capitalism. And what I wanted to know is that prior to that was sort of this capitalism based on serfdom, fiefdom, and uh, Lord of the Manor protecting the poor, that failed. Then we switched in the industrial era to what is called the company town. And basically the expectations that companies provided for health and education and everything and well-being and, and food in addition to jobs. And that model, of course, was fraught with corruption and problems. So the idea then became if uh, the majority of the people are the ones who are working, if you can make them consumers, that shifts that power dynamic in their favor, it's sort of like trying to shift tax dollars in their favor. And that's failed. So now we're saying we, we need a different model. And the question is, what model is that going to be? Um, yes, we, we do believe that uh, indigenous ways of knowledge are beneficial and must be respected. And we also acknowledge that they've been problems in indigenous models. Um, if you look at uh, in Kenya, the amount of deforestation from charcoal and looking at that in terms of indigenous communities and over-dependence on wood-based fuels. So then there are times when the tragedy of the commons happens just because of sheer population growth and the fact that as more and more people, for example, uh, Dad always likes to say Kenya has the same boundary and uh, from independence in 1964 till today, we've gone from 7 million to 55 million. So this is not about trying to say that people cannot have children. It's just the logical outcome that happens when you have um, growth and the amount of resources available are finite. So what models are we going to use if we want to continue to grow as humans, knowing that the amount of resources available are finite? I didn't know if there were any additional reactions to that, planet of the humans. <laughs> uh, can I? Cecilia, can I add something? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much uh, uh, for that clarification. Now, in Korea and, and East Africa Renewable Energy Federation, we, are t we have about a population, population in East and Central Africa, we have a population of almost 800 million and uh, less than half have no electricity. That's our concern. But on the other hand, observations put by this panel, members of this panel, like Diambo, whom we share the same name with, is correct, that we should encourage technology transfer so that we manufacture this. Right now, in Korea, it's only Naivasha. There's a company in Naivasha which manufactures solar panels, of course, through hardship, there's a lot of challenges, quality, it cannot, the quality cannot be compared with those which are imported, but on the other hand, they are there, they have been there for 10 years, it's, they are members of Korea. So there are challenges and we are taking them head on. We can't run away from them. We have, on the other hand, we are game changers. We have to change from the over-reliance of major hydro with the, with Power failure, like what Cecilia has just experienced, we just those have just came apart. Can apart disadvantages? Please, we'll help you out of that through solar, through renewable energy. There won't be any power failure because we'll be controlling it in your in your domestic home, in your own house. So if it is fail, it is you. You will blame anybody like Kenya Power or anybody else. So those are the game-changing projects and innovations which you want. 
So I take your point positively that the capitalism can only be changed when the technology is already transferred and renewable energy, there are factories to manufacture the tools and equipment. Of course, we are very far from that as of now, but that is the, the vision and the mission of Korea as a professional body. We have importers so far. The best we could do is to import, but alongside that, we also import the technology and retain the technology. And we're working, we're working very hard on that through training, training, sensitization in all 47 counties, through training systems, and the regulations we are changing and we are adapting to agree with one of member of the panel who say that the regulations are too many and are probably hindering because those regulations even are not there, we cannot work. And we are rely on these expatriates and capitalists, the, the manufacturers to help us with the regulations, how they regulate it in their own countries. So we still rely on them and we are trying to work very hard with, with them hand in hand on a partnership to transfer the technology and the skills and the knowledge so that we retain it and then we start our own factories. So we are working on that with our members. Some of our members are international, as much as some are local, but we encourage the local participation very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead. May I just, yes. May I just one thing? First, I want to apologize that I arrived late due to traffic. And I want to just bring this discussion on focusing uh, highlighting the, the impact of insects. Uh, if you look at the deforestation that we are making in the, in the globally, we are increasing the activities of the termites. And the termites are producing more methane, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, and CO2 into the atmosphere. This was not there when the deforestation was not there because the food for the termites is in the ground uh, wood that is dead and they feed much more. So we are increasing the numbers of the termites. That one is not because the termites like it, it is because we are the people who are doing it. The second example I want to bring out is the role of mosquitoes. I came to Nairobi the first time in 1957. And at that time, uh, malaria was not prevalent in, Mos in Nairobi. Malaria was prevalent in Mombasa, Lake Victoria and those lowlands with fresh water lakes, uh, fresh water lakes. And uh, as time, we have improved the spread of malaria to the highlands because of the increase of the temperature, the global temperature or the climate change temperature, whichever one you want which one definition you want to take. And as we increase the global temperature in the highlands, which was colder because mosquitoes cannot live at temperatures below 15 degrees uh, uh, Celsius, the temperatures in the highlands have been increasing. And not only has the temperature been increasing, but we have been moving and trading from the lowland to the highlands. And we humans are the ones who are the transmitters of mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are just spreaders of, mos of malaria. But we, we carry the mosquitoes, some of us carry the, the, the malaria parasites without feeling any impact for up to six or more months. And when we travel to other areas where there is no malaria, 
and the malaria mosquitoes have become habitable in those areas. Then they bite us, and as they bite us, they start the malaria process. And then the spread of the malaria begins in the highland. So right now we have malaria in the highest areas of our country and in the continent, which is due to as human activities. These two examples would really uh, amplify the Anthropocene, how we are affecting the environment and we are affecting us. So those are the two points I wanted to bring out in this discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dad, and, and that is actually really useful in terms of biodiversity. Right now, we've been looking at uh, preservation of uh, fish species or animal species. We hadn't talked about insects. And looking at those two examples you've given are sort of different ways of looking at the issue of sentinel species looking at the changes in termite behavior and looking at the changes in uh, uh, mosquito behavior is one and uh, two different ways of understanding the way in which nature is reacting to our human activities and sort of sort of sounding an alarm call um, in terms of giving us signs that what we're doing is causing problems. So the, the, thank you for those examples. So we've now reached almost 8.15 and this is a, an incredible group. I, it's been a wonderful discussion for uh, two hours going and um, any last comments before we sign off? Because we don't want to exhaust anybody. Okay, I just I can go first. Yeah. Uh, let me just say, uh, well, thank you too uh, for all the presenters. Uh, it's been very insightful um, right from the beginning. And I think there's a lot of work which all of us need to do. And I, I think we should not be discouraged. Um, and the world is, uh, is actually changing from time to time. I like uh, that example uh, Dr. Wondiga has actually said about arriving in Nairobi back in the 1950s. And there, were no, uh, there was no malaria in, in Nairobi but only in the coastal areas, but right now we do have issues with that. And of course, it's even gone beyond into the highlands. And that is just something to let us know that the world is actually changing. And most of it is because of our very own activities. So we need to do something about it. No matter how small it is, we just need to do something about it until probably maybe we get more and more uh, people also stepping up and doing something around it. So. Any small little bit of action works and uh, let's just keep going uh, ahead and doing the best we can. Thank you. Yeah, Cecilia. Uh, yes. Hello. Yeah, mine is very brief. It's only to thank all the panelists and to put it sincerely that we need your support. And already we are using major hydro highly high capital intensive and that's why the bills are shooting up many domestic cannot support electricity in their domestic homes and therefore the sun which is solar is just we are just using it for uh for drying maize drying omena fish and then we eat there's another use of sun to generate electricity and we are trying to exploit that as much as possible through our members and we need your support all of you thank you for the wonderful presentation and i hope the presentation will be shared so that we can go through thoroughly and see how we can add renewable energy to the biodiversity changing game changing projects and operations thank you very much 
Yes, uh, the recording and the presentations are going to be shared. It'll probably take me a uh, uh, couple of days to put everything together, but they'll definitely be shared and made publicly available. Khaled, did you, you're also one of the speakers. Did you want to add any concluding remarks? I uh, just want to say thank you so much to everyone for, you know, spending your taking time out of your days to come to this uh, seminar and listening to us and uh, contributing. It was great discussion. I liked the many different aspects uh, that the presentation inspired, whether it was renewables, malaria, mining. It felt really good to, you know, just bring all of that broad focus uh, to here. And I hope that we can, you know, converse and meet again in the future. So, and thank you also, Cecilia, for hosting. It was much appreciated. <laughs> Definitely, Khaled. And this is this is actually really fun because our, our initial charge was to make this an African discussion. And as you know, uh, you, you said, you know, we, we tend to use that word loosely when we're on the continent. So by joining from South Africa, you're helping us get to that goal uh, here in the East. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you very much. All right. Thank Take you care. All. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Thank you and good night. Good night.